Good afternoon. Uh, so, in the morning session, uh, we had uh, uh, talked about uh, the remaining part of electrostatics. What we did uh, at that time is to talk very briefly about what are dielectrics, also goes by the name insulators. So, basically what I said is the following, that in dielectrics, uh, unlike in the conductors, uh, there are bound charges. You see conductors are characterized by charges which are free, uh, they can move around if you apply an electric field, but in uh, dielectrics basically the charges are uh, tightly bound to the atoms of the molecules to which they belong. In some situations the positive and the negative charge centers coincide and uh, even in the absence uh, uh, in the absence of the electric field and if you apply an electric field there would be a separation of charge. Uh, what we did is to uh, define what we called as the polarization vector. So, polarization vector was defined as the uh, essentially the uh, dipole moment per unit volume. This is vector p. That is sum over i p i if you take an assembly of a volume then divided by the volume. That is the meaning of the dipole moment per unit volume. And what we proved by looking at the potential expansion up to the dipole terms. In fact, the expansion that we did is popularly called the multipole expansion and uh, in fact, if you kept another term it would be quadrupole term, but we kept only up to uh, dipole term. So, what we said is the following that if I have a dielectric here and if I am looking at the potential at some arbitrary points, then the net potential can be expanded uh, in terms of various moments of the charge distribution. For example, the zeroth moment of charge distribution is simply rho r d r that is just the charge q that is nothing but the zeroth moment of charge distribution. Uh, the dipole moment as we said has been defined as the first uh, moment of the charge density. So, which is essentially r rho r d r over a volume, you have to normalize it over a volume. So, this is uh, what we kept and we said well I mean I can expand the potential in terms like this and then the next one would be quadrupole moment and octopole moment and things like that. So, the idea is something like this that if this distance and you know the you have to keep less and less terms the farther and farther you go. So, for instance, if you are very far away, then it might be even good enough to ignore even the dipole term. In which case, this dielectric essentially seems like a point at the location of p. That is, its electric field is essentially the uh, this p should not be confused with the polarization vector, this is just a point. So, and that is obvious because if you have a block of uh, any matter and if you are looking at it from a very large distance of course, uh, it looks like a point charge. So, that is that is fine. The, the other thing that we did is to do that and looking at the uh, potential expression, what we did is to find that the expression for potential has two terms, one which uh, essentially gave us the surface charge. So, I call them bound because they arose from different type of uh, charges, they are not free charges as we are accustomed to talk in the conductors. We said this sigma bound is given by the normal component of the polarization. So, basically we found an expression for the potential which was surface integral of p dot n divided by r minus r prime etcetera etcetera. So, that by comparing it with the typical expression for the field due to a surface charge, we found that the dielectric has a surface charge density and which is equal to p dot n. The other one is that 
there is a volume charge density again we will call it rho bound or rho b just and that is given by negative divergence of the polarization vector. So, we will later on in the tutorial sessions we will try to work out some problems and you will find that the net charge of a neutral dielectric anyway turns out to be 0. Only thing is that the charge distribution works out to be different. The other thing that we did is to say that now that we have more or less finished electrostatics, let us try to summarize the equations uh, that we have. So, remember del dot of E was shown to be equal to rho over epsilon 0. This electric field is the actual field. What do I mean by an actual field? By that I mean this is the field that if you put for example, a charge Q there uh, at a point, uh, the charge Q will experience a force which is given by Q times E. So, that is what I meant that that is the field that you always determine experimentally. So, del dot of E equal to rho over epsilon 0 is what we said, but then if I have this rho having two parts namely the free part like in a conductor the charges which are free and I have rho bound divided by epsilon 0. So, this part came from the polarization component and what we do is this that I can rewrite say that epsilon 0 del dot E is equal to rho free and rho bound if you recall I said is minus del dot P. So, therefore, what I do is I take this term to the left and find that del dot of epsilon 0 E plus P this is given by rho free. Notice that there is no divided by epsilon 0 here. So, the dimension of d vector originally called a displacement vector, but today the displacement vector nomenclature is reserved for different things. I will continue to call it d vector del dot of p is d is equal to rho free. So, this is my Maxwell's equation now and the this is supplemented with a definition of d in terms of E and the polarization. So, these are normally called a constitutive relation. You will later on see for, for example, the Ohm's law is a constitutive relation. So, these are not parts of Maxwell's equation, but they have to be taken uh, along with the Maxwell's equation for a proper definition. So, this rho free uh, if I want to calculate d vector is basically a intuitive co construct and in a given situation it may not be possible to actually separate rho free from the rho bound. Now, it also then uh, says that if I try to find out what is the surface integral of d over a closed volume, uh, closed surface, closed volume. Remember that this equation gave us uh, E dot d s that was my uh, flux of the electric field to be given by q enclosed divided by epsilon 0. Now, this q enclosed is now both the free charge as well as the bound charge. Now, however, if you would rather like to do the d dot d s which is the flux of the uh, displacement field if you like d vector that is simply given by q free. There is no divided by epsilon 0 for the dimensional reasons that I told you about. And so, del dot of is equal to this. So, this so far is my uh, collection of and of course, as long as I am in electrostatics my del cross of E is equal to 0. This we have seen that this is always valid. With this uh, let me temporarily uh, you know shift to uh, the discussion of uh, magnetic phenomena and uh, magnetostatics to begin with, uh, because in these lectures I have to ultimately come to the electromagnetic field 
and things like that. So, that was what we did in the morning and let us do the following. Now, going to magnetostatic, first let us look at the differences. You will realize uh, the mathematics is very similar. So, I do not really worry about that is the reason we spent a lot of time in doing uh, the electrostatics. The first statement to make is that free electric charges exist. That is I have a positive charge, you have a negative charge. Now, one does not know of magnetic monopoles. I mean one clearly does not even know whether they actually exist or not. The supposing you take a magnet there is it always consists of a north pole and a south pole. You break a magnet into two each one of them will have a north pole and a south pole and things like that. Now, so remember we had defined an electric field by saying that what is the force it, it exerts on a charge q. We said electric field E times q is the force that a charge q experiences when placed in an electric field. Now, I cannot give you the same definition here. The reason why I cannot give you the same definition is there are no magnetic monopoles known to exist. Now, you notice that I have not been making statements magnetic monopoles do not exist. Well, I have written it that way, but that is because there is no theoretical reason why magnetic monopoles that is an isolated magnetic north pole or a magnetic south pole cannot exist. There is nothing special about it. If they did, uh, we also know how to change our Maxwell's equation. The, there will be nothing greatly wrong with it. But the point is that last several years, hundreds of years literally, people have searched for the existence of magnetic monopoles. They have occasionally there have been reports that they have found it, but on the other hand as of today there is no reliable information about anybody having established the existence of magnetic monopoles. So, we will assume for the purpose of this course that magnetic monopoles do not exist. Now, if the magnetic mon monopoles do not exist, then it means the magnetic poles always appear in pairs. In other words, in any given volume, the net magnetic charge if you want to use that word is equal, always equal to 0. Now, re remember we said that our del dot of the, the surface integral of the electric field was given by well q or q by epsilon 0 depending upon whether you are uh, choosing the uh, d field or uh, the e field. But in this case, since there are no isolated magnetic monopoles, the corresponding flux expression uh, that is surface integral of b uh, over a closed surface b dot ds must be equal to 0, because the amount of magnetic charge that is contained inside enclosed is equal to 0. So, what we do is this. We if, since we cannot isolate a magnetic charge, but we know how to isolate an electric charge, we define the magnetic field. We, uh, later on during the lecture, I will point out that the magnetic field is purely a relativistic effect okay, uh, as I go along. So, but interestingly, we divide, define the magnetic field in terms of the force experienced by an electric charge in the field. Just the way we define electric field by the force that and again an electric charge experiences in that field. So, there is a slight difference here. The electric charge experiences a sidewise force in the magnetic field and the force is given by the, the net. Supposing there is a combination of electric field and a magnetic field, the force is given by the Lorentz force expression which is q times e this we have been talking about all these days and q times v cross b. That is if the velocity, so notice very interesting thing that uh, the magnetic field exerts a force on a charged particle a sidewise because it is perpendicular to the direction of v b as well as the direction of v. 
So, in other words, if the velocity direction only has a component along the direction of the magnetic field, the force is equal to 0. Okay. Once again, where do we find, mag how do we create magnetic field? What is found is that the current is the source of the magnetic field. The a steady current is the source of the magnetic field. Now, uh, let us define first, what is meant by a current? Uh, the, there are issues there, uh, because of various reason, uh, we do not, you know, we do not quite distinguish sometimes the d difference between a current and a current density. Uh, we, uh, you know, if you ask a school student that is current a vector, uh, they will say yes, current is a vector. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the word current when it is used in the proper sense, which is the amount of charge that is crossing a boundary of surface of a volume per unit time. Uh, that is the rate of change of charge per in the volume. That is not a vector, that is a that is a scalar quantity. But of course, the magnetic the uh, current density, which is what we will define later, turns out to be a vector quantity. Now, if I am having a steady state, there is obviously no accumulation of charge. Now, since there is no accumulation of charge, what it means, remember this is something which you have been talking about earlier. So, let us say, I have just given some sort of a volume and let us say this is the bounding surface. This is like a uh, current carrying wire. Now, you see the, uh, if you cut a cross section there uh, between two wires. So, the electric charges are coming in, traditionally the current direction is taken to be the uh, movement of the positive charge direction, but of course, we know that what moves are actually electrons. So, therefore, the direction of current is actually opposite to the direction in which the negative charges move, but that is not very particularly important. So, what we did is to say my current is charge density times the velocity okay, dotted with ds, because this is my definition of current density. right? And uh, so, therefore, my minus of j dot ds minus sign because of the reason I told you is the rate at which my total charge is changing in that volume. And remember q is in, uh, integral of rho dv. So, therefore, what I get is that the change current which we have written down uh, and by uh, I convert this j dot ds using our friend divergence theorem into a divergence of j uh, and the volume integral of that. So, q is integral rho dv. So, therefore, you just combine these two and get an expression which is d rho by d t plus del dot of j is equal to 0. So, the, this is basically what we wanted to talk about that uh, this is called equation of continuity. And if the there is no accumulation obviously, in such a situation there would not be an accumulation charge. So, therefore, I would not have this term d rho by d t equal to 0. So, I have the definition of a steady current namely del dot of j equal to 0. All right. Having made that statement that uh, the source of magnetic field is steady current. The, now, I need to uh, formulate a law like we did for the electrostatics, the Coulomb's law. Uh, we said that if there is a charge, what is the electric field expression for the electric field there. Now, in this case, the corresponding law is called the bayard savarts law. So, what we are saying is this that source of the magnetic field is basically a current distribution. So, here uh, this red, this is my uh, you know some sort of a wire through which let us say the current is moving. Now, how do I calculate the magnetic field due to such a current? So, what I do is this, I split this uh, current flowing into small sections and I uh, the define the direction in that small section by the tangential tangent to that uh, direction of the curve at that point. So, that let us call it d l prime. O is my origin, the current element as we call it is located at a vector r prime. So, direction of the current now, notice that I have given 
a vector sign there. And I have said that that is because the length element has the same direction as the current density and which in this case is along the tangent to the curve. So, supposing I have a DL there and I am interested in finding out what is the magnetic field at a location R. Now, this is now a law. The law as you know that these have been found to be true by doing experiments that this is like Coulomb's law. I mean you do not question where did you get it from. Okay? So, I want to also question. So, we say that the magnetic field contribution d b r due to this length element is given by. Now, remember we had in the electrostatics 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. In this case it turns out a different factor mu 0 is called the permeability of the free space that was called permittivity of the free space. So, mu 0 by 4 pi. So, that is a constant which will come out. This is proportional to the current okay, uh, flowing and the it is basically an inverse square law again because it is proportional to 1 over r minus r prime square, but it is because we said that the force is sidewise the magnetic field direction is given by d l prime direction cross r minus r prime. In other words, it is perpendicular to the direction of d l prime and this and that is the magnetic field that direction that is you know established here. It is inverse square, but it is uh, direction is given by a cross product relationship. So, now this is the important uh, all important bias of Hertz law. This is the one which takes place of Coulomb's law. There is a lot of similarity. The similarity is in the fact that there is a proportionality with the charge, uh, the, the uh, charge, the role of charge is taken by a current here. So, there was a Q in your uh, electric field expression, I have an I there. There is a 1 over r square there, here also we have a 1 over r square here. The difference is, the difference is that if there is a current element, the direction of the magnetic field is given by a cross product. So, other than that, this is your main law uh, comparable to the Coulomb's law for uh, the magnetic phenomenon. So, let us, let us look at uh, what do I get if I want to write it in slightly different way. So, what I will do is this that since it is a bit of an algebra in spite of the fact that I have several times been told that do not waste your time on uh, derivation, but sometimes uh, deriving helps uh, and particularly if you want to understand something. So, can we just switch over. So, we said my uh, differential uh, value of b at the position r is given by a constant mu 0 by 4 pi this incidentally like 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 this constant keeps on coming back. This times the current strength i multiplied by I have d l cross the vector r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime q as I told you that this is also in some sense an inverse square law. So, this is what I have got. So, in order to get b, I need to of course, integrate this. So, I have mu 0 by 4 pi i, so that is not a problem and I do the integration of, uh, well remember that here is an i there, which is nothing but my current density. Now, what is current? Current is the surface integral the j dot d s is the current. So, therefore, what I will do is this, this i times d l is essentially in the direction of j. So, this I will write j of r prime cross r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime cube. I am determining the field at the position r. So, r is not an integrated variable, the variable of integration is r prime. So, this is what I have got. Okay. Now, I do some manipulations which we have talked about for quite some time. So, we have got 
mu 0 by 4 pi integral. So, I will write this as del of 1 over r minus r prime cross j of r prime some explanation required for this. So, you notice that the gradient of 1 over r minus r, r prime is minus r minus r prime by r minus r prime uh, cube. So, I have not taken a minus sign, but what I have done is to interchange the cross product. As you know, a cross b is equal to minus b cross a. So, this times d cube r prime. This is what I have got. Now, I do a bit of a manipulation. This is the only long derivation I will be doing. So, mu 0 by 4 pi. So, I use again a chain rule differentiation. So, I will write down this as uh, in the following way. I will say this is equal to del cross j of r prime divided by r minus r prime is actually very straightforward and trivial d cube r prime. Why was I able to do it? That is because you notice that this del cross is taken with respect to variable r, not with respect to r prime. Let me put that there. And j of r prime is a function which is the dependent on r prime, which is not the same as r. r is a fixed uh, coordinate. So, fixed means uh, the position of the, uh, it is the position coordinate of the particle point where you want to do that. So, I could simply borrow this here. All right. Now, since I again do this, this is the mu 0 by 4 pi. Now, since del is taken with respect to r variable, so it has no effect on that interact integration. So, I will write this as del cross integral j r prime by r minus r prime. So, this expression for b, this is b at the position r. You can see why I did this. You can see immediately why I did, did this because I could write b as a curl of a quantity. So, therefore, my since I know divergence of a curl is always equal to 0, I get del dot of b is equal to 0. This is the formal way of getting that where did we get that from. So, therefore, summarizing again, the basic principle behind our derivation is the Biot-Savart's law. That is the only thing that I have assumed. Using Biot-Savart's law definition of current density etcetera, I have been able to show that del dot of b is equal to 0. Now, as you know that I have been making this statement that uh, in order to know a field completely, I need to also point find out uh, not only the divergence of the field, but I also need to point out what is the curl of that field. So, what is curl b? But before I go that, there, okay, let me uh, repeat that anyway. So, b of r is given by mu 0 by 4 pi del cross integral j of r prime, which is of course a vector divided by the scalar r minus r prime d cube r prime. There are two things I want you to notice here. First is because b can be expressed as a curl of a quantity, as I pointed out that this tells you my del dot of b is equal to 0. That is the magnetic Gauss's law. The second thing that I want you to realize is that b has been written as a curl of something. Let us just call this something. So, this something uh, plays a very important role there. We will see later that 
I will represent this something by a quantity called a vector potential. Okay, we'll we'll come back uh, towards that. Okay, so next question is what is del cross b? So obviously this is nothing. I have b already. So I say del cross b is mu zero by four pi. Del cross. Now, whenever you write del cross, del cross, you be very careful because these brackets are extremely important. All right. Now, notice this is del cross, del cross of something, and this is almost a formula. Del cross del cross a or whatever. This is this is something which we keep on using in electromagnetic theory. So it's probably a good idea for you to almost remember it. So this turns out to be del of del dot of a minus del square a. Let us look at what is then del cross b. So my First term is this is obviously my a along with mu zero by four pi term etc. So let us look at what is this del of del dot of a. Now this can be written as I have mu zero by four pi, which of course comes there. I need my gradient there. Now then I need a del dot of a, so del dot of this quantity. So let me let me write it like this: del of uh, del dot. I need del dot of j of r prime divided by r minus r prime. D cube r prime, which I will put in a minus sign there and make this del dot as del prime dot. Because it is only acting on the denominator, and so therefore I can take care of this. Okay, so how do I take care of such a thing? I write this as the following. Uh, okay, I have made a minor mistake, but let me try to correct it. Minus mu zero by four pi. Let me write it down. Del of uh, integral of del prime dot. Let me write that down. J R prime by R minus R prime minus one over R minus R prime and del dot of J R prime. This is what I have got. So this quantity then, what I have is the following: that and dotted with d cube bar, of course. The let me erase this line. This is wrong. Let me keep it like this. Okay, so I I don't even need that minus. Now what I do is this. I realize I am dealing with steady current. You realize I remember our equation of continuity. So this told me that this term must be equal to zero. So continuity equation tells me that del dot of j is equal to zero. So I am left with now. A term which is mu zero by four pi, and here what I have is this: that this is a by divergence term theorem. I can convert this into a uh, surface integral again. So I can write down this as del of a surface integral of j r prime over r minus r prime dot d s. Now this has to be equal to zero. Now, this is very important, small but important point. You see, when I say that I am taking it over the surface, one of the techniques that we very frequently do is this: we say, "All right, it doesn't matter how big your surface is, so extend the surface to infinity." Now the fields that you do, take care; the fields all go to zero at large enough distances. So therefore, this integral, which 
I can expand the bounding surface to take it to infinity and so therefore, this integral will turn out to be 0. Now, if you do that now, then what I am left with is simply the term del cross of j del cross of b is equal to mu 0 j. I am sorry for minor arithmetic errors, but it will be all correctly written on the in my uh, notes. Okay. So, we have got del dot of b equal to 0, del cross of b is equal to mu 0 j, these in some sense are new magnetostatic Maxwell's equation. Let us just do one or two calculation, because in this session I am more interested in talking about a uh, couple of things, which are you will find interesting. So, one law which you have found out uh, is called Ampere's law. Remember, uh, when we did Coulomb's law and then came to Gauss's law, many of you commented that, well, what good is Gauss's law, uh, because it is very difficult to work out in general situation, which is correct. Exactly the point that in case you have symmetric situation, then it makes much more sense to trust your intuition and try to get a solution, rather than trying to you know in a simple situation having a very big uh, technique is not a great idea. So, let me consider what happens to the um, for example, supposing I am looking at a long straight wire. Look, I said that del cross of b is equal to mu 0 j. Now, in this case, I take for example, now notice that uh, this tells me that supposing I am to do a surface integral del cross of b dotted with d s and take the surface integral. So, this is mu 0 j dot d s, but remember this is current density. So, j dot d s is nothing but my current. So, it is mu 0 times i. Now, what I do is this, I do a little uh, algebra. This is surface integral of a curl and I use a Stokes theorem on that. And convert this into a line integral of the magnetic field itself. So, I get integral b dot d l is equal to mu 0 i. You may note that since this came from Biasavart's law, this also has its origin ultimately in the Biasavart's law. So, this is what I call as an Ampere's law. Is that uh, a any less rigorous than Biasavart's law? The answer is no. Just as Gauss's law is completely equivalent to the Coulomb's law, this law is also completely equivalent to the corresponding Biasavart's law. Now, let us let us see why we start sometimes using this. Again, the problem of symmetry. Supposing I have a long straight wire. Now, if there is a long straight wire, long enough so that I do not have uh, to worry about uh, the edge effects. Now, the direction of the magnetic field due to this current is already told to you by the Biasavart's law, because I have said it is d l cross r, d l in supposing this is my z direction, supposing I am looking for a point here. So, you take any current element going like this, d l cross r has to be perpendicular to d l as well as this r. Since both these lines are on this plane, then my magnetic field contribution due to this will be in a plane perpendicular. Okay. Now, this is from the Biasavart's law is the content of what we call as the right hand rule. What the right hand rule tells you is this, that you assume that you are holding that current wire 
I am assuming that there is a plastic jacket on it, so that you do not get a shock and then curl your fingers around it and let the thumb point in the direction of the current. In that case, the sense in which your fingers of the right hand curl gives you the direction of the magnetic field. So, once again the right hand rule which you have learnt right from the school days is also coming from the Bayer's law. And, and notice this. So, therefore, I, I will since the direction keeps on changing, it is much easier to take the azimuthal, obviously it is an azimuthal direction. So, the magnetic field direction will be the phi direction. So, how do I, you have done this several times that now use the symmetry that all over if I take a circle, a long straight wire cannot distinguish between different points on that circle. It is an extremely symmetric situation. So, I have a long straight wire and I am looking at a point P. Now, draw a perpendicular and supposing this distance is R, what I am trying to say is all points which are at the same distance from the wire, they must be identical, the direction we have already talked about. So, what we do is this, what is B dot D L then? Now, the B dot D L in that case must be whatever is the magnitude of the magnetic field at each point, integral if you take it, times the length and which is nothing but 2 pi times r. And this we said is mu 0 times i. So, therefore, the magnetic field vector is given by mu 0 times i divided by 2 pi r along the direction of phi. Now, I know that you are all familiar with this, but the point is that what we have tried to point out here is Ampere's law comes from Bayer's law. The right hand rule comes from the Bayer's law. Like the Gauss's law was a could be used in extremely symmetric situation, I can also use the Ampere's law in symmetric situation. So, Ampere's law has limited validity though it is equally powerful can be used okay, gainfully in symmetric situation. Now, notice I am not going to work it out because you have all done this. Supposing I am looking at a circular coil in the plane of the paper carrying a current. Now, can we use Ampere's law here? Very interesting point. You realize if you are working only along the axis, only along the axis, then there are enough symmetry there. But the you will find that you will be normally required to work this problem out using a Bayer's law. As I said, most of you have done such things, so I will not be unnecessarily reporting it. Let me take another device which is very frequently used and all of you have been worried about it. And this is what is called a solenoid. Remember when this name solenoidal came up lots of questions were there. So, so basically a solenoid is a device like this. Now, this is uh, what is called a solenoid, this is the picture of a solenoid and uh, so what we do normally is to say that look, what is actually the way the solenoid is happening. Remember that the current must enter one point and come out in each turn. So, this is what I am showing here that uh, this is actually the current centering not the magnetic field. The current enters here, takes a turn and comes back here and like that all the turns go. Now, if you look at a length much larger than the width, now you will be able to see show that the solenoid gives you a constant magnetic field. Now, these are important that how does one generate constant magnetic field? There are other ways which we will talk about. Inside the solenoid, today I am talking about it for a reason. Inside the solenoid, 
the field is constant and as you are all aware that it is given by mu 0 n i along the axis of the, but point is that one can show because of the fact that the current is going in in one case coming out in the other case, the net effect is to give you a 0 magnetic field outside the solenoid. So, for the solenoid the uh, magnetic field is constant mu 0 n i uh, inside the solenoid outside it is 0. So, let us remember that for uh, something that will be coming up with later. Now, let us come to another interesting point. The point is the following, let me try to uh, illustrate it here itself that supposing I have two uh, current carrying uh, wires, loops whatever arbitrary shape loops. I am trying to find out what is the force exerted by one current loop on the other. So, I know that, that if I know the uh, magnetic field at a particular point, then uh, the force experienced by this length element d L 2 due to the magnetic field here. Right? Remember that the magnetic field exerts a force on a moving charge and currents are nothing but moving charge. So, therefore, this is basically your Lorentz force law. So, if I am talking about that what is the force that is exerted on this element here due to the magnetic field here. So, magnetic field by this element is d b 1 and here I have got i 2 because this is i 1 on this and i 2 on this. So, my uh, force is given by i 2 d L 2 cross d b 1 and you we have already got from bias Sabat's law an expression for d b 1. We read that and then take the uh, all the you know uh, integration over the uh, loop which is producing the magnetic field. You get force on 2 due to 1 is given by the integral. Now, there is already an integral over d L 2 okay, because I am looking at what is the force exerted by this loop on that loop. So, I have an integration over d L 2 as well and there is an integral that I require to create my magnetic field. So, I have got f 2 1 is mu 0 by 4 pi i 1 i 2 this is fairly straightforward but that is not the reason I wrote it down. I wrote it down to find out that if this is f 2 1, what is f 1 2? That is what is the force exerted by this on that? Now, clearly you will say interchange 1 and 2. I interchange 1 and 2, there is no change in this i 1 i 2 because it becomes i 2 i 1 which is the same. I get this as d L 1 cross d L 2 cross r 1 minus r 2 divided by of course, again it is the same because r 1 minus r 2 modulus is the same as r 2 minus r 1 modulus. All right. So, I have to show that f 1 2 is equal to f 2 1. So, how do I get f 1 2? f 1 2 is this. What is f 2 1? Interchange 1 and 2 all throughout. Now, in order to show this, you again need some smart algebra. So, you notice this d L 2 cross d L 1 cross r 2 minus r 1, this is interchanging. I can write this that is why I told you that A cross B cross C formula is an extremely important relation. What is A cross B cross C? A cross B cross C that is A cross bracket B cross C is B A dot C minus C A dot B and this is all that I have written down here. You notice already the second term is already anti-symmetric that is if you interchange 1 and 2 it just becomes the minus sign is the first term which is creating problem, but I need an integral. Now, when I need an integral, I notice that this quantity is frequently written as minus gradient of 1 over r 1 minus r 2. So, this is what I have got here. The moment I have a loop, closed loop, a line integral of a gradient, I clearly I can use Stokes theorem convert it into surface integral, but then it is curl of a gradient which is equal to 0. So, this first term will turn out to be equal and the second term is automatically anti-symmetric. So, in other words the Newton's third law is valid for the forces between the currents. Let me come to an interesting point now. Point that I am trying to tell you is this that where did this magnetic field come from? There are no magnetic monopoles 
electric at least we had the electric uh, charges so we said that all right they give rise to a field what is this magnetic field how do you understand now this is something which you try to understand because this is not what you find in a standard textbook the magnetism phenomena it arises essentially due to electric forces because the only force that we know okay basic force as i told you there are only four types of forces in nature you have of course coulomb force that's the only force that we know of so magnetism also comes because but how does it happen i will show you by a simple example not a very rigorous one but a simple example that magnetism arises because of relativistic effect so in order to do that let me give you a uh, interesting problem supposing i have two long straight wires okay just a little while back i had written down it is though i said i won't derive it but it is important so suppose i have two parallel wires carrying current now the we want to find out what is the force due to two parallel wires carrying current in this case it is i can calculate again by field and things like that i can show that two parallel wires carrying current separated by a distance d exert a force on each other of course in this case an attractive force which is mu 0 times the strength of i1 strength of i2 divided by the distance between them there are factors like 2 pi etc so mu 0 i1 i2 by 2 pi d uh, the parallel attractive forces are there okay this is this is an expression which i will require so i have told you now that consider two line charges you remember what is a line charge a long straight wire which carries charge there is no current there just charges static charges let the charge density of this be lambda 1 let the charge density of this be lambda 2 now this person here which i call as s is observing this situation from a laboratory so what does he see he sees that there are two line charges okay now let us look at let's call this frame s in the frame s because there are two static line charges there are only electric fields and we know that the field due to the line charge number 1 okay at the location of 2 the distance is d is given by lambda 1 by 2 pi epsilon 0 d r okay now what is the force that this exerts on this now remember that these are only fixed charges so therefore the force is purely electrostatic right so and this has a charge density lambda 2 so that means it has a charge lambda 2 l so therefore the force as we just now calculated is given by lambda 1 l i mean not calculated just now but when we did line charge for electrostatics we said it is lambda 1 lambda 2 l divided by 2 pi epsilon 0 d so this is the expression for the force between the two infinite line charges all right now let's do the following let us look at another observer who is moving along the length of the wire with a velocity v i will call this observer as s prime now you have learnt or you will learn in some of these recent courses that uh, some of the courses to be given by professor prashad on relativity that when the this person looks at this length this means the length gets contracted this you have learnt in special theory of relativity in your masters program now if the length gets contracted since the total charge cannot be created this means that my charge density increases the factor by which the length contraction takes place as you all know is gamma which is equal to 1 over square root of v square minus by c square so therefore since the amount of charge must remain the same the charge density becomes gamma times lambda and the length has become l by lambda length has got contracted charge density had got increased 
so that this into this still remains L times lambda as we want. Now, remember that lengths are contracted along the direction of the velocity, but this distance d is perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. So, therefore, there is no contraction in this direction. All right. We still talk about what is the force as seen by the observer in S prime. Now, once again look at what we did this this. We said well instead of lambda 1 you have gamma lambda 1, instead of lambda 2 you have gamma lambda 2, instead of L you have got L by gamma and of course, D did not change it does not get contracted. So, if you cancel the gammas 1 gamma you are left with gamma times L. So, the force between two uh, wires as seen by the fixed observer is f as seen by the observer s prime is gamma times f. So, what is the problem? Two observers look at things differently. The problem is the following. If you remember this is gamma times f. If you look up your relativity books which I presume it will be done towards the end here, you will see that the transverse force remember the force is transverse it is perpendicular to the direction of the uh, length. The transverse force f becomes a by gamma not f into gamma. So, what has happened is my observer s prime has found this force to be f into gamma whereas, theory of relativity told us that it should be a by gamma. Now, obviously the theory of relativity is right, but this how does S prime look at such a situation. So, S prime says that look I can understand gamma f part of it, but I should have actually got a result f by gamma. Now, the shortage that he has the difference between f by gamma and gamma f which is able to explain he is able to explain by electrostatics and he is not able to get this. So, he postulates there is an additional force which I do not understand. How much is that additional force according to S? So, f by gamma is what he should have got gamma times f is what he is getting. So, take gamma f common write it as 1 over gamma square minus 1 I have given you the expression for gamma it turns out to be v square by c square with a minus sign. So, this is f prime v square by c square. I already gave you the expression for f prime put it there. So, this is now what you are getting because I take i equal to lambda v I have converted this into i 1 i 2 l prime by this. Now, remember immediately that this expression is what we wanted right. I had uh, shown that the magnetic force between them is given by uh, the magnetic field if you remember is mu 0 i by 2 pi uh, r etcetera. So, therefore, the role of mu 0 is taken by 1 over epsilon 0 c square remember mu 0 appears in the numerator. So, mu 0 equal to epsilon 0 c square is actually a rigorous result from relativity. So, summarizing the observer fixed in the laboratory sees only a electrostatic forces between charges the because that observer is moving he also sees that charges are moving with relative to him. So, that is equivalent to a current. So, in his frame of reference there is also a magnetic field. The last uh, thing that I want to do today is the definition of a vector potential. So, we had curl of B equal to 0. So, in electrostatic field we had said curl of E equal to 0. This enables us to define a scalar potential E to be equal to minus gradient of phi, but magnetic field is not irrotational that is its curl is not equal to 0. Magnetic field on the other hand happens to be a solenoidal field. So, that del dot of B equal to 0. Now, if del dot of B equal to 0 we ask can we define something similar then I know recall that divergence of a curl is identically equal to 0. So, I will say that B then 
must be given by curl of some field A. This is what is known as a vector potential. I now recall for you the famous Helmholtz theorem. which said that a vector field can be split into two parts, one part a solenoidal, the another part that is del dot of b equal to 0, another part which is your um, irrotational. But here you notice that I only have b equal to del cross a. So, in order to fix b uniquely, I need to define another field. See, this is a field whose divergence is equal to 0. Basically, I have del cross of A, right? curl of A is. So, B has a physical meaning. Now, what about A? Notice, a curl of a gradient is also equal to 0. So, what I do is I say that look, if curl of a gradient is equal to 0, so I will write down del cross B, that is equal to del cross del cross A. And I told you this is del of del dot of A minus del square A that is equal to mu 0 j. So, what we have been saying is this that you can add to A a term which is gradient of a scalar field. Okay? You can add so so, A is not unique. For a given B, now this is very similar to what we had talked about in case of a scalar potential as well. We have said that gradient of phi does not specify phi uniquely, only thing is there it was a much simpler thing. We said that the potential could be differ by constants and it will still give you that the same thing. So, what we say is this that 2 a, 2 a we can always add a term which is gradient of a scalar. So, it goes like this. Now, so suppose you have you, are, you have got like this. You say that look I want to choose I want to choose del dot of a equal to 0. This is incidentally called a Coulomb gauge. So, suppose I want to, so this thing that to A we can always add a term which is gradient of a scalar, this is what is called a gauge choice. So, one of the gauge choices is for example, del dot of A is equal to 0. Now, notice we said that a vector is completely specified by giving its curl and divergence. Now, we are saying here that look you have chosen A, curl of A is given to you, curl of A is B which is physically meaningful. I can still choose the divergence of A as I like that is what we said. This gauge is known as Coulomb gauge and most of the problems people work out in Coulomb gauge. The question then is that can you always find a such a choice. So, what we are saying is supposing I would like to have the Coulomb gauge, right? but I happen to have chosen a gauge which does not satisfy del dot of a equal to 0. The question I am asking is can I always do that? Supposing I have chosen A. Now, let me say 
all right choose a different a given by a prime equal to a plus some gradient of some scalar psi i have not yet said what is psi then del dot of a prime remember i have chosen an a whose del dot is not zero because and i want to find out can i choose by some method for that problem a vector potential whose del dot that is divergence is zero so let's find out what is del dot of a prime it is obviously del dot of a plus del square psi this is what i have got now i am saying you have already chosen an a so we have chosen a del dot of a is not equal to 0 but i know what is it so therefore if i am to choose if we choose del square psi i want to choose a function del square psi such that it is equal to minus del dot of a this will give del dot of a prime equal to 0 so what happens what happens is this you have chosen a gauge corresponding to your magnetic field you know what it is this function you know so if you plug into this equation this function that you have chosen then all that you need to do is a solution of a poisson's equation and and the solution of poisson equation can always be found so basically what we are trying to say is this that even if you have started with a gauge for which the coulomb gauge condition is not satisfied but you are in love with coulomb gauge you can always by this process go over to a coulomb gauge so i can always choose the gauge that i want do i have an expression for a the answer is yes again so maybe i can go back so this is what we pointed out that you can always do a choice now remember that for the scalar potential we had uh, obtained an expression like this that is phi at r is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 rho r prime by r minus r prime and integral rho r prime by this we had shown that bayer schwarz law gave us this expression for b of r that tells me that a of r is given by an expression like this mu 0 by 4 pi j of r prime r minus r prime d cube r prime it is important to realize that the vector on the left hand side is a the vector on the right hand side is j of course this is being integrated but let us look at some interesting consequences there are take for example a long straight wire now look at this now if i have a long straight wire then the direction of j of r prime is fixed so suppose my current density is in the z direction then the because this direction does not change integrated the direction will not change so a's direction will be the same as the j's direction which means it will be also in the direction of k but let us look at whether i can do a calculation like this or not now you will notice that this is not going to give you anything if a is in z direction j is in z direction a is in z direction and so write down that uh, j of r prime because the direction is fixed is uh, your current divided by the area and so that is what we have done there now you do that integration you get it in infinite this is obviously not a good thing but you remember we said that choice of a can be different so the question is is there a way of finding out a vector potential which will give me the same magnetic field now there are many ways of doing it so this is your expression for the vector potential let me go back to the magnetic field remember it's a long straight wire so the magnetic field is known to me to be mu 0 i by 2 pi r along the phi direction the direction in which your fingers curl and by definition 
then it is del cross of a r the phi component of that. But go to uh, cylindrical coordinate, your cylindrical coordinates as you know is rho phi z. So, write down what is the phi component. Remember the phi component is uh, dou by dou z of a r minus dou by dou r of a z, but we have seen that uh, a is along the z direction only. So, this term is not there. So, I am left with as d a z by d r is mu 0 i by 2 r. You integrate this and you find out it is mu 0 i by 2 r logarithm of r. So, this is the relevant thing and of course, I could choose any gradient that I like. The only other thing that I want to talk about in the last 10 minutes that I have is that let us return back to the question of a solenoid. Remember what I told you and this is a very important point which because of which I am raising this issue. Remember I proved that or we you all know that the magnetic field inside a solenoid is along the axis and is constant. So, magnetic field outside the solenoid is 0. Look at this picture and try to see let us calculate what is the magnetic vector potential corresponding to this situation. Now, first let us do inside. This is almost doing like Ampere's law. So, around the axis inside have a circle of radius r or l does not matter. So, I am trying to find out how much is integral a dot dl. Integral a dot dl by Stokes law, Stokes theorem is del cross a dot ds which is equal to b dot ds which is nothing but flux. So, you notice an equivalent expression for flux is a dot dl just as it is b dot ds. Now, we said that the direction of A is the same as the direction of the current and in this case the direction of current is the phi direction. So, therefore, A is A phi phi and B is along the z direction. So, therefore, if I do a line integral of radius s, I get 2 pi s times phi A phi which is equal to this is equal to your phi b. What is phi b? Phi b is the flux. So, how much is the flux? The flux is mu 0 n i times pi s square because flux is magnetic field which is mu 0 n i times pi s square which is the area. So, the magnetic field gives me a an expression for phi which is given by a phi given by mu 0 n i by 2 into s is fine. More interesting thing is supposing I did the same job outside. Now, if I take a outside loop the for s greater than r the line integral is still 2 pi s a s and but the flux is only due to the part which is inside. So, this is mu 0 n i times pi capital R square where r is the radius of the uh, this circular cross section of the solenoid. So, that gives me that the azimuthal component of phi outside the solenoid is given as mu 0 n i r square by 2 s. Now, the summary of it is the following that for a solenoid the magnetic field long enough solenoid without edge effect the magnetic field is constant along inside the solenoid and along the axis of the solenoid outside it is equal to 0. But the corresponding vector potential is given by mu 0 n i s by 2 s is the radius radial distance inside the solenoid outside the solenoid unlike the magnetic field it is not equal to 0, but it has a value which is mu 0 n i r square by 2 s. Now, the next question is that you would say so what after all the vector potential is not a physical thing. So, therefore, a vector potential outside the solenoid is not equal to 0, what have we lost? The there is some very interesting experiment and the experiment is shown here, it is in this way that imagine I am doing a Young's double slit experiment, but I am doing it with electrons. Now, you know that one can do since uh, you have been having a course in quantum mechanics, you know that the electrons also have a wave character. So, therefore, 
whatever you did with light for the Young's double slit experiment, you can do it with uh, electrons also. The corresponding de Broglie wavelength waves would also show diffraction. Now, what I do is the following experiment. So, here I have an electron gun which is going and in its path I have put a very small solenoid. Initially there is no current in the solenoid, I mean in the uh, uh, turns of the solenoid. Now I will get the fringe pattern because now imagine that what I am doing is that let me just talk about two paths. Supposing one path is going around the left of this solenoid, another part is going around the right of the solenoid and I get a path difference. The presence of the solenoid is unimportant, I have taken it uh, negligible. Whatever is the path difference, based on that I will get a Young's pattern. Now what you do is put a current in that solenoid. Now if you put a current in the solenoid, you will see so, so what? The, the electron beam is passing outside the solenoid. So therefore, if there is no path difference which is introduced because of that. However, it turns out that you will find that the fringe patterns will now be shifted. The reason why the fringe pattern will be shifted is because though the magnetic field inside the solenoid is uniform, outside it is equal to 0, but the A, the vector potential is not equal to 0 outside and this would add to a phase. Now, this is well known as the Aronoff bomb effect that you will find the fringe patterns shifting because of the fact that there is a vector potential outside which introduces a path difference or phase difference between the two paths around this because they are not exactly at the same point. So, therefore, even though the vector potential has been taken to be a uh, sort of a technique for getting magnetic field and all that, the reality of the vector potential is very much there and it can be experimentally tested. I would like to stop here and from tomorrow the first time I will of course take up your question and then we will go over to time dependent phenomena. Thank you.